So uh, I, I'm going. I, I'm not going to have a presentation. I'm just going to show a few things here and there. Uh, my name is Zainab Tufekci. I'm an assistant professor at University of North Carolina. And uh, this is the whole event is Chatham House, but I wave Chatham House. This is very, I'm very public with everything I'm going to say. So if you want to ever attribute it to me, unless I specifically say no. Uh, yeah, feel free, uh, but do remember to ask me questions unless they wave that they're on the chat now. So, which means you don't attribute who they are. You can say what they said, but not who they are. But for me, you can. Uh, I'm public. So, what I want to talk about, I want to get started. I want to emphasize that I am not going to do a uh, talk about how awful it will be when the machine come and how great human decision making was. Because the reality is human decision making is very faulty and biased and awful. And we don't like to admit it, but there's a whole number of studies about it. Uh, one very striking one I read recently was looking into um, probation and parole for prisoners in Israel. And they were trying to understand if there were, um, you know, there were harsher sentences and less probation in the probation hearings. There are uh, harsher. Uh, responses to Palestinian originating citizens or you know non-citizens versus Jewish origin ones. So when they systematically looked at the data, what they found was the big difference wasn't the ethnicity of the prisoner. It was whether the judge had issued the order before or after lunch. Before <laughs> lunch, it was harsh. After lunch, it was much nicer. So that was the dividing line. And I bet you the judges are completely unaware of that. Uh, when I was doing my dissertation defense, my grandmother, who was then in her 80s, traveled to the U.S. because she was like, oh, she's my, you know, my granddaughter, she's graduating, I'm going to be there. And she was feeling a little bad because she doesn't speak English. She's just going to sit there for a couple hours and listen to me speak in English. I said, no, no, you're very needed. I need you to cook food for my committee. Because my dissertation was at 11 a.m., the lunch hour. I knew that I'd be screwed if I let my committee, you know, listen to me for two hours and be hungry because they would hate what I had to say. If they were hungry, they'd have no idea. So in a lot of things like that, uh, we have a whole study of how biased human decision making is. Things like flying, you know, when I get on a plane, I'm very sort of statistically minded on the way to the airport, especially if it's in Istanbul, where I'm originally from, I'm really, really tense, because that's dangerous. I get on the plane, I'm like well regulated and some computers are running most of it, so I'm pretty happy with that. It's well tested. And in fact, you know, the joke is the future um, flight will be a pilot and a dog. The co-pilot will be a dog whose job will be to bite the pilot if he tries to touch anything. <laughs> and we'll probably all be safer for that. Self-driving cars? I can't wait. I mean, I, 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 I don't... I, I teach 17, 18 year olds and I ask them, how many of you text and drive, all hands go up? How many of you text and eat and drive, all hands go up? How many of you text and eat and change the radio and drive? So, you know, uh, can't wait for those things. And it's not like, com you know, it's not like the new communication technology is that we, dis we can f discuss a lot about the tensions that come from new technology. That's certainly true. There's a lot of tensions that come, for example, from being connected all the time and your boss is emailing you and you know you need to be on a conference call at 11 p.m. because it's 8 a.m. in San Francisco. You know, those kind of things are increasing our tensions. But, you know, on the other hand, it's solving a lot of problems, too. You know, you think of, I'll think of Romeo and Juliet, right? Uh, <laughs> the modern version would be, hey, Jules, are you dead? And, you know, Romeo would be, uh, Juliet, Juliet would be like, nah, I'm just trying to, you know, get rid of the parental unit. Oh, that's fine. And there would be no crisis and misunderstanding if they just had WhatsApp or something like that. They, the whole drama would not be there. <laughs> Although, on the other hand, I can imagine then the man that Juliet was supposed to be married to, forced married to seeing their picture on Facebook. And then, you know, the drama could re restart again, unless Juliet remembered to unfriend him, then we have new traumas. So what am I concerned about? When I, I want to start with this human decision making false because there's going to be a lot of areas in which the computational algorithmic model is going to do a lot better by a lot of people on these decision making things. One of the ones I can think of is hiring where there's a lot of algorithmic hiring going on. On the one hand, there are concerns, and I'll talk about it. 
Uh, on the other hand, study after study shows that human hiring is very, very faulty. We tend to hire people like us. We end up in companies with a lot of people who look like us, are from schools like us, and are not necessarily, you know, who we should be hiring if we were hired based on either performance or more diverse perspectives. Um, if, for example, you send resumes in the United States, many, many studies, and some of the resumes have black sounding names, in the US it's distinct, and some of them have white sounding names, we have tons of evidence that black sounding names get turned away almost at twice the rate with identical credentials. So a computational model wouldn't have that bias. Uh, in fact, you see this again and again. Women used to not be very uh, common in symphony orchestras until they started blind auditions. Once you couldn't see the gender of the performer, all of a sudden women started getting hired uh, by orchestras. So there's ways in which changing the process from human beings to some other system and formalizing what computation can do. But it's going to come with many complications and new things, and there are concerns. And I have grave concerns. <coughs> you know, all that said, I still have major grave concerns, which I'm going to discuss for now the next 25 minutes, now that we got uh, that out of the way. Um, because I think it, we'd, be, we'd be fooling ourselves if we said human judgment was great. It was not. But there are other things that it was that uh, machines won't be. So what's happening right now? What's happening right now, broadly speaking, is in multiple areas. That's called, that's online platforms. We focus on them, Facebook, Twitter, Google, because we can see them. But that's just one part of where the algorithms are moving. And I'll talk about what I mean when I say the algorithms are moving uh, to make decisions. Uh, to hiring, to, we discussed this yesterday, flagging who's a terrorist, who should fly, who should not. These are becoming computational decision making too. Um, predictive policing, uh, using data to crunch where uh, policing should be increased and where it should be decreased. Healthcare risks. Companies are using personal cons uh, consumer data, like financial data, to crunch who they think is a higher risk. What should you read? Who, what should be on top of your newsfeed on Facebook? All of these are being decided computationally more and more. And the trick here is, um, there's these, they're not new, there are new ways of doing these computations that people have been trying to do for a long time, and they've been through multiple boom bus cycles, sometimes people call it machine learning, sometimes call it deep uh, learning, uh, neural networks, call it what you want. Uh, it's, it's artificial intelligence of sorts. There are new ways of learning things, uh, teaching machines or, or machines learning things that didn't used to work very well in their boom bus cycles when people thought it's never going to work. Well, it turns out they needed better computational infrastructure, they needed better processors, and they needed more data to work. And they're working much better, and I will uh, unpack the better part, in very novel, interesting ways. And I'm a former programmer, I follow the technical field, I'm kind of blown away by what's coming out every single month in terms of what these systems can do. And these systems are fascinating and powerful partly because they're no longer being programmed based on rules. They're being thrown a bunch of data, they're given an outcome that is supposed to happen with some feedback, and they learn, and then they learn how to learn. We are not telling them this is what you should do. We're telling them, here's a bunch of objects, try to figure out what they are. And if they get it right, they're told they get it right, and then they keep going at it. So in the end, we do not understand how or what they've done. This is very different than programming a rules-based thing where you say, if it has four legs and a back and a this, call it a chair. If it has this, like if I was giving instruction, it's almost like raising a kid of sorts and not knowing what it's going to do. You give it some input, but you don't really know what the heck it's going to end up doing or why. And I, I don't mean to give these things life, but there's certainly a different kind of agency being developed. And this is the thing that um, 
if Google is developing very complicated and pretty powerful systems because it has a lot of data and interest in this, but they're not alone. And what these computational new systems are doing, which for me is like really worth examining, is they're making subjective decisions. Like all the examples I gave, flying a plane. You know what? We have a yardstick. Are planes safer? For the most part, except some long tail events where something unexpected happens and human pilots make an error because they're kind of out of practice. Flying overall is much safer because of automation. So we can say we're on the right track. But take uh, something like Google show you relevant results, which is what Google says. We aim to give you. Google's definition of an algorithm, and I quote unquote, I can pull it up, is an algorithm crawls the web and gives you what you want. That is a very subjective thing, and that's not what that algorithm is doing anyway. It's page rank is doing something else. But it's like, how do you define what I want and what's right? There is no answer. Um, who is or deciding like who's a better job candidate? There's not really an easy right answer. What should Facebook show you on top of your its news feed? There's no easy answer. There's no right answer. There's no wrong answer. You see what I'm saying? We are empowering machines to make decisions for us in areas where we don't have a yardstick. I mean, it's one thing if you give the machine some differential equation to solve, you know what the answers are, you know whether it works or not. Uh, that kind of objective computation, there's no terms for these yet. Uh, it's a whole different ballgame to have these models make subjective decisions in which we do not have ways to calibrate, except through like what people kind of say. Now, to add to this, they have gotten complicated enough, especially if they're doing machine learning rather than rule-based, they've gotten complicated enough, their operation is opaque to us, because it's just so complex, the branching is so um, huge. I and mean, it's kind of like, you know how they play with humans, they bring your partner or spouse or whatever and says, you know, will she, what will she say if I asked her or him this? That's like a television game. You try to guess what the other person is going to say. And if you know them really well, you can usually kind of guess, but nobody really guesses. Our machines are more and more like that. It's not easy for the programmers even. If you gave them the inputs and said, what will, um, which one do you think you'll pick? Well, the humans don't really know it because that's the whole point of putting the algorithm at work is that we're trying to do something different. And we don't try to terribly understand. So we have subjective decision making. Even if you have the code, it's not totally transparent and intuitive way to. It's hard to figure out what it's going to do. And these are being deployed at scale and making these decisions. Now, the other aspect of this is that they're making decisions in an environment of information asymmetry. Which means, and I'll try to explain what I mean, the technical term for what I'm about to talk about is latent inference. They are able to guess with a lot of accuracy things about you. For example, in one study, researchers who used Facebook likes from volunteers, 55,000 I believe, were able to model and predict with 80-90% accuracy for most of these. <coughs> Sexual orientation, race, gender, political persuasion, party, personality type. There's something called big five in psychology, extroversion, introversion, neuroticism, that clinical psychologists use to, um, they, they use scales to measure. Just looking at people's Facebook likes will give you as good as a clinical psychologist with test retest rates. Um, researchers can tell using just social media data, Twitter data is enough, even though it's so short, uh, who's very likely, highly likely, to fall into depression before the onset of clinical symptoms. Right? So before you have any clinical symptoms of depression, your corpus on social media can figure out if you're likely to fall into you know, depression with clinical symptoms in the next month. Now, this is a friend of mine who's done this. Uh, there's other people do. Uh, and her reasoning is, 
well, it's going to allow early intervention. A lot of these things are done with the best of, um, she, wants to, she wants to use social media data to identify people who are at risk. And now I'm going to, if we have not lost, yeah, I, I want to show you guys something um, about what I think about. I'm showing you something from a different presentation. Hold on. I'm going to show you guys. Uh, this is a recent article in Ad Week. Um, this is, I mean, there's, this is how they think. Great, if it will ever show us, I'm not sure that. All right, we'll have to figure out. Well, it was saying that marketers should. Uh, I, it's blank on my end, and I don't know why. It doesn't like it. No, of course not. All right, here we go. We'll just go from here. I, I'm not going to play it. Um, Marketers shouldn't take note of when for women feel least attractive, what messages to convey, and when to send them. This is a straight out article in Ad Week. I, I love reading the industry press. Everybody should read it. Uh, basically, the article, if you can, you can read it, says women are more likely to buy makeup when they feel, I quote, fat, lonely, ugly, depressed. <laughs> Now, and you're like, okay, isn't this old marketing? Like, you, isn't this the marketing since the 20s, 30s, uh, as long as you can do it? It is. But now, they can tell which one of you is feeling depressed, as opposed to putting it up there on television. And if I saw an ad like that, I would be upset. And it would backfire with me. But they never have to show me. You see, if they can use the social media to stream, who's likely to feel this, they can show an ad playing on that vulnerability. Not just an ad. This thing is getting better and better because of the information asymmetry and because online environments are uh, shaped more subtly. They could nudge the women feeling depressed towards a pretty rescue by slight suggestions. Now this concerns me in multiple ways. The model of like total surveillance state we have is George Orwell's 1984. And I've been saying for years, you know, there are places in which that is still the appropriate model, but for our kind of Western imperfect democracy-like things, whatever they are, whatever you want to call them. Totalitarianism isn't the regime you're gonna get. Huxley's regime is the one you're gonna get where the state and the corporations know so much about you that they can play to your vulnerabilities in a very personalized, individual way. Now, there was a study, I'm going to reference a bunch of studies. Now, there was a study uh, in Nature, which Facebook published, to their credit, I think it's good that they published this, uh, it's worth thinking about, which showed a slight tweak of the kind of voting message people got. Some people got go vote, and the rest of them got um, your friends voted, go vote. There's a slight teeny single message that was randomized. So half the room randomly got one, half the room randomly got other. So in 2010, that boosted the turnout among the people who got the slightly more social message by about 400,000. This was published in Nature, major state. Now on the one hand, this is fascinating. Like you can see the slight changes in what kind of thing you see makes you act differently, which makes total sense, that's how people are. On the other hand, 400,000 is more than the difference of votes between Romney and Obama in the right states. And this was a teeny tweak, because the researchers were responsible. They weren't trying to throw the election. They were trying to tweak and get a publishable paper. Um, you know, you guys heard of the brouhaha or the emotional contagion study where seeing slightly more positive thoughts made people feel a little more, you know, post slightly more positive uh, stuff and uh, seeing slightly negative posts made people post slightly negative things. Once again, it was randomized and it was a slight tweak, right? The researchers are doing this. The publications you see are this kind of research, as far as I can tell, being done responsibly because the tweaks are tiny enough to get statistical significance. 
What's amazing is that that tinier tweak has such measurable effects. You could imagine more tweaks getting much more significant effects. News, seeing news makes people more likely to vote. Google rankings totally changes people's perception of candidates. So, um, I don't think it's inconceivable. I'm not saying they would do this, and I'm not concerned with the current corporations. It's a question of the power these things have. In the current environment, it is not, based on public studies, it is absolutely possible, and once again, the claim is not they've done this, it is absolutely possible that a couple of major platforms with um, major gatekeeping roles like Google and Facebook and somewhat Twitter could swing elections in a manner that was not visible. And this is, I, I'm not the first one, only person to have thought of this, because if you look at the study, and you look at all the marketing things, and you realize the power that these platforms have. Now currently, like Facebook won't sell your, that kind of info to the advertiser, right? It just gives them demographics, and so the advertiser doesn't see your data. But your data is there to be seen. You know, who knows where this is going to be in 10, 20 years. Uh, your public data is scraped all the time. So through a process called onboarding, your offline data and online data that are increasingly merged. The profiles these computational systems can draw off you, they're strikingly complicated and right a lot of the times, and wrong a lot of times. And it's kind of hard to tell which is which at the scale. There are problems when it's right, and there are problems when it's wrong. In a widely discussed um, article in the New York Times, um, Target is a department store in the US, it's a supermarket. Um, a father was upset that her teenage 15-year-old daughter was getting baby product ads from Target. And he was like, what are you trying to do? You lose my 15-year-old you know, to get pregnant? You know, so you're sending diapers and all of that. And the manager was so sorry. He said, oh, mix up. Oh, I apologize. You know, we'll just make sure. And sorry, sorry, sorry. Well, then the father had to come back and apologize the next week because the daughter was pregnant. And the way Target can tell this is not some crude thing like, you know, they bought a pregnancy test. There are, once you have enough data in these methods, you can detect very subtle things that might not have occurred to you as a person. Turns out, you know, things like slight shifts and, you know, women apparently switch to organic milk, and they might be doing all sorts of things that don't look very related, but with enough data, you can tell. Uh, and this is valuable commercial data because, you know, having a kid changes consumption patterns, so marketers really want to figure out when people are going to do that, because you can get them onto new brands and then they'll be too hairy and dizzy to ever think, uh, what else should I buy if we both have kids? Um, basically, these, this is an information asymmetry, which really concerns me because like, when you see an ad and you don't really, like, you, you can't get your defenses up if you don't know why you're, you're being targeted and how you're ta being targeted. There's a lot of efforts right now by the gambling industry there was a conference where uh, somebody who studies this uh, talked about it. They are trying to find people who are prone to compulsive gambling and nudge them. It's not, you know, there's practically nothing I can imagine that there's not some way that you can use this information to figure some of it out. And then since online environments are more easily malleable, you can figure out how to nudge things. Partly because you can do experiments at scale online. Like, political campaigns do this all the time. They randomize and they show you this message and they show you that message. And whichever, it's science. And whichever works, it's social science. They kind of go at it and then they really are learning how to deliver messages that work a lot better. Now, I do want to emphasize, advertisers have wanted to do this forever. They want to play on people's vulnerabilities. Political campaigns want to persuade you. Uh, it's just the tools that were available have drastically changed. Computational tools have drastically changed, um, and data has drastically changed in an environment of information asymmetry in just 10 years. And we're in an environment where we try to talk about these things, and in the US yesterday, uh, someone who's part of the Senate Judiciary Committee that looks over privacy issues said, oh, I've never used email. So the people who rule us 
And we're supposed to protect our privacy. Like, forget what's machine learning development. They've never used email. They're, they're like barely <laughs> out of the 20th century. And we are in a different kind of problem because of this. So the other thing that is concerning with um, this is, uh, let's see. I don't have sound here. Well, I'll, I'll just tell you about it. Uh, that is of concern is that the, I, I said human decision making sucks. It often does. But there is a particular pattern to it. We're biased in many, many ways. And we have spent millennia grappling with the imperfections of humans and our problems. And we're not nowhere near done, but we've spent like, all our institutions. All our sort of cultural efforts, social movements, they're all kind of geared towards trying to grapple with the kind of errors and mistakes and biases and bad things humans do. Now machines, they don't work the same way. They make different kinds of mistakes, and I don't think we're at all ready for it. Um, I'll give you guys two examples. One of them is, have you heard of Watson, IBM's deep learning system? Well, it's not, it's an associational system, but there's a game called Jeopardy where you're supposed to know a lot of trivia and you have to figure out natural language to understand what the question is and what the, the, the host tells an answer and you're supposed to figure out what the question would be. It's complicated knowledge there. Jeopardy, um, the, the Watson team, the machine, beat the heck out of all humans. It was faster, it got everything right, it was just you know, you looked at it and you thought, okay, you can see how useful this system can be as some kind of diagnostic system aid or something like that. It was like the people were 10, 20 fold behind the machine. So comes what's called a high stakes final jeopardy game, uh, that there's one answer and everything depends on that answer. And the question is, Here's a U.S. city with this kind of an airport. What's the, you know, what, 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 what is this? So Watson says Toronto. Like, this is not a mistake a second grader would make. Toronto is in Canada. It's such an absurd mistake right there you're watching on TV. And I'm like, wow, this is really interesting because this is a great example of how machines who are able to do a zillion things and that fail in ways we don't predict. Like if you're watching a human Jeopardy player and there's a really hard question, you get a sense that they're going to fail at this. And an easy question, you're like, oh, they're going to get this. Whereas with a machine, their error pattern is different. So it's very hard for us to figure out where they're going to fail. And this is something we need to really grapple with because what's the problem when they're right? Like for example, if they're identifying who's genuinely depressed, and then marketing, you know, cosmetic crap to them, that's a problem if they're right. Or if they're finding compulsive gamblers and marketing, that's a problem. On the other hand, if it's a hiring algorithm, and if it's wrong, that's a whole other different kind of thing. And since, we, since these are too complex, in hiring, one of the biggest correlates of job performance turns out to be commute time. If you have a short commute to work, you tend to stay at work, especially if it's a low paid crappy job. That's a high predictor. Now, as soon as the hiring algorithm people saw this, they went, whoa, because they realized that correlates to neighborhood, which correlates to race. And it is illegal in the United States to discriminate on the basis of race. So you would have coded in direct racial discrimination in the US, in many cities, because the minority neighborhoods have crappy public transportation. So that's recognizable. There's going to be a lot of things like that, where the machine picks something. And we're like, okay, this works. And all the company is going to see is more sales, or the politician is going to see uh, more votes. But it'll actually be discriminating in ways that we're not totally even getting. So my final example, because we have Facebook people in the room, I have to pick on Facebook, uh, is the example of uh, Ferguson protests, which became a big deal in the United States complicated story, but uh, and they were being very heavily discussed because of an over-policing situation in this little town in Missouri, and 
uh, a young man was killed, the community was upset, they were protesting, the police showed up with tanks, people were more upset, germs being arrested. I was like, am I watching Pyro? Or it was, it was ridiculous. Uh, and in Facebook, the news groups <laughs> algorithmically curated, it was pretty disappeared. Like, Facebook wouldn't show it to me, even though my friends were, when I looked up, otherwise my friends were posting it. I started searching and I saw that lots of other people were having the same problem, and people were like, what? Well, the theory is not that Facebook, you know, suppressed these on purpose, which kind of float around, that's not at all. Or Occupy didn't trend in the United States in major cities like New York. And people were like, is Twitter censoring Occupy? That's not what happened either. What had happened? In the case of Facebook, is that the algorithm has like and comment as input, which deprioritizes things that are important but not very likely because you have no way of telling the system. It's got this complicated way in which it works. So it, it was just happening. It was just a result of the way it's planned. With Occupy, what had happened was Occupy had built slowly instead of spiking, and Facebook's trending algorithm the scans slow build <coughs> and the word spikes. It's the same bias actually of evening news kind of bias, like if a homeless person buys in a awful fashion will be news, chronic homelessness won't be news. Twitter's trending system actually incorporates this kind of bias into all of its algorithm. What I'm trying to point out is that these algorithms have different level politics. You set them loose and they do certain things. Especially when there's no right answer, there's no way to say, oh, it's a machine, it's computational, therefore it's objective. It's not. But the way it's right and the way it's wrong is different than the way humans are right and humans are wrong. And everything we have, our states, our voting, our institutions, our cultures, everything is set on the way humans are right and humans are wrong. And now we have subjective decision makers that are going to call it different patterns and we are so not ready for it, uh, given that you know, people uh, in power don't even use email much. So that's sort of my concerns in a um, nutshell, I guess. Thank you very much. Thank you.